Well, we had a great start to TESS 2018 yesterday morning, uh, an inspiring keynote to kick off the day, uh, a whole series of interactive and engaging workshops from colleagues and peers, and I'm sure you're ready for the start of day two. We have as our speaker this morning uh, a good friend of eCampus Ontario, uh, Dr. Robin DeRosa. Uh, Robin joined us in 2017 for our first ever Open Education Ontario Summit as one of our resource persons and did a brilliant job along with another colleague, Rajiv Shangjani, to really begin to whet the appetite of Ontario higher educators to think expansively about the opportunities presented by open education and open educational resources and open pedagogy. And Robin is going to speak this morning as part of our opening plenary. Uh, her current research and advocacy work focus on open education and how universities can innovate in order to bring down costs for students, increase interdisciplinary collaboration, and refocus the academic world on strengthening the public good. All attributes I think we can agree that we share. Robin is a professor at Plymouth State University, part of the University System of New Hampshire where she directs the Interdisciplinary Studies Program. And many of you probably also know that she's an editor for Hybrid Pedagogy, an open access peer reviewed journal. Please join me in welcoming Robin DeRosa. Thank you, my friend. All right, let me get all my tools, stand on my box. <laughs> now I'm really big. Um, thank you all for having me. I am so excited to be back here. I was telling some folks earlier that I said to David, you know, how many times have I been here? 10, 11 times? He said, just one time. Um, <laughs> But I feel like there's a lot of friends here, and I'm really excited, uh, especially for the babies. Um, I also want to point out that if you want to follow along, there is a rough transcript of this talk uh, at bit.ly slash TESS18. Make sure you use capital letters in that URL, and uh, it's perfectly fine to call that up on your laptops. But also later, all of the images have um, embedded descriptions there. So for your screen readers and whatnot, it will be a, an accessible version of the talk that you can enjoy um, afterwards as well. Um, and as you are probably all aware, Toronto is in the Dish with One Spoon territory. The Dish with One Spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee that bound them to the territory and protect the land. Subsequent indigenous nations and peoples Europeans and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. And I would like to begin by purposefully acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of these indigenous peoples, of the Wendat, the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Métis, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation. So somebody asked me online if this keynote was going to be interactive. And if I ever gave you the impression that I'm the kind of person who would foist an interactive experience on a bunch of academic introverts who are comfortably settled in to watch a show, I am indeed very sorry and I apologize. But now I have to apologize again because I'm going to ask you to participate in a very short activity. Um, so it's going to be a raise your hand kind of activity. So what I want you to do is think about a person that you know very well. It could be you a friend, a family member, a student, whatever, but someone whose life experiences you know intimately. To protect our anonymity, please don't tell anyone who you're imagining. Okay, so you've got that person in mind. I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand if your answer to any of the following questions is yes, and keep your hand up. And if your answer is yes to more than one question, then put both of your hands up. Okay, so raise your hand if in the last four years, this person had a family member or close friend die, or suffered a significant physical illness or injury, or was challenged by anxiety or depression or another mental illness, or had trouble meeting work expectations due to a learning or physical disability, or had trouble paying an important bill, 
or had to care for a family member unexpectedly, or had second thoughts about a career or life path, or discovered a surprising new passion or interest. So I just want to recognize that, oh my gosh, like literally almost every hand is up in the room. OK, so you can put your hands down. We will refer to this in a moment. Um, I direct a customized undergraduate major program at a rural public university in the US. And my students are an interesting cross-section of learners. Some came into the program as highly self-motivated first-year students with cutting-edge commitments to forge interdisciplinary programs. They merge sometimes technology and media studies, or physics and music, or biology and environmental science. Others are pursuing more vocational degrees focused on things like occupational therapy or art therapy, majors that my school doesn't offer due to its small size. And a third group is trying to complete a degree after being away from college for a time or failing out of a previous major or changing their minds late in the game about what they want to study. The questions that I asked you to raise your hands for all relate to life experiences and conditions that affect most of us at one time or another. It's the rare student who can complete, for example, an undergraduate education, even a two-year degree, without finding that circumstances throw up barriers and curveballs to their expected course of study. Sometimes these are difficult challenges, like the student I had years ago whose mom was a single mom and she died uh, pretty quickly of cancer, leaving my student, a 19-year-old residential college student, with sole custody of her seven-year-old sister. Sometimes there's unexpected twists, like a student I had who desperately wanted to be an athletic trainer, but who found herself unable to pass anatomy and physiology after three tries because she had some learning disabilities and the class was taught in a way that made it really challenging for her to succeed. Sometimes there's exciting possibilities that still manifest questions about how a student should proceed. For example, I had an art education student who discovered graphic design in her final year of college, and she no longer wanted to do student teaching to become an art educator. She wanted to fill her final semesters with computer science and design and media studies courses so she could apply her art experience to her new passion for design. I teach in a somewhat unorthodox program built specifically to offer solutions to these kinds of situations. But it seems to me that these students are all of our students. There's almost no student anywhere who isn't faced with bumps in the road, and yet our institutions and pathways are laid out as if these bumps are highly unusual and necessarily and unavoidably an impediment to the smooth flow of learning and education. This is Tiffany Richards. She gave me permission to talk about her journey and use her photo. And some of you who know my work know the influence that she's had on my thinking about education. A few years ago, Tiffany walked into my office. She was planning to drop out of the nursing program, and she needed to make a new plan. This was not unusual. Every semester, I meet with several students who are quote unquote dropping out of the nursing program. Uh, it usually means they failed to meet the GPA requirement for a certain course, and they've been ejected from the major. Tiffany was one in a long string of students who had dreams of being a nurse, but who found themselves needing a new plan, generally against their own wishes. But her story was different. Tiffany had a brain tumor. Tiffany's brain tumor meant that her short-term memory was going to be affected, and she'd be unable to reliably dispense medication. So nursing was no longer an option for her. She had an A average in her nursing courses and a year of foundational science education under her belt. She also had a sense of excitement about the possibilities, which is classic Tiffany. After spending time in the hospital after her diagnosis, she became interested in the role of the patient advocate who assisted her. And she came to see patient advocacy as a logical and even inspiring future career path for her. It was her sense of excitement about her new path, coupled with the obvious realization that her former path was not open to her anymore through no fault of her own, that caused me to have an aha moment. Like a lot of my aha moments in education, after I had it, I was ashamed that it took me so long, since the epiphany would have been obvious far earlier had I done one important thing, looked beyond my institutional blinders to see my students as human beings. So 
The exact epiphany was that when a student reshuffles their academic credits in the wake of an affecting life experience, education is enhanced rather than impeded. When Tiffany combined her science and nursing specific courses with new courses in psychology and social work, this was not a bailout or a disruption. It was simply a refiguring of the horizon. Same past, new future. But when you think about it, our educational institutions aren't built to recognize the complexity between pasts and futures. In effect, we build these superhighways with one on-ramp and lots of off-ramps that lead to dead ends. At the end of this superhighway, there's supposed to be this coast that you're aiming for. But sometimes, you want to change directions. You want to go to the mountains or to the plains. But it's going to take you so much more gas. And gas is expensive if you change your itinerary at that point. As we saw for all, from all of the hands up in this room, life is constantly throwing up detours and crossroads. And instead of linking these to other well-lit and well-marked roadways, in our institutions, we assume that anyone who changes their itinerary, even for really good reasons, doesn't deserve a worthwhile trip. This is actually nuts, because it's not consistent with what we know about building knowledge or learning, growing, succeeding. When I saw Tiffany take these credits that she'd already completed and apply them to a different way forward, it occurred to me that this was the exact kind of lifelong learning that most of our institutions claim to encourage. You take a baseline content, you propel it through iteration and innovation to an incrementally new area outside of what the preparation had planned for. This kind of iterative and constant reframing of education is part of learning that institutions generally impede for our students. This is a slide now of a guy doing a backflip. We'll see why in a moment. Tiffany was a sophomore when she began to shift from nursing to patient advocacy, but other students I work with are literally just a few credits shy of graduation when they need to pivot due to an obstacle or a change of heart. Those students undertake the kind of backwards design that those of us who are scholars know really well. When I write a book, for example, I start, I have my topic, I have my thesis even, and I develop it, but I don't write the conclusion or even the introduction until the end of all of my research. And no one would expect me to start my book and write it from page one to the end without ever going back and revising. We don't call backwards design of courses or research projects bailouts. So why should a student who successfully completed many course credits who now wants to recombine them and reconfigure them to do different work uh, be accused of taking a bailout degree? This isn't just a plea to stop labeling reconfiguration as a bail. It's also about leveraging the power of this experience for student growth and for the growth of our academic fields, both of which stretch in new ways when content knowledge is coupled with, a, with an applied high-impact learning practice. And that applied high-impact learning practice is living a human life. As Tiffany underwent treatment, she was still committed to staying in school. A number of students in my program have faced cancer, and many of them appreciated the ability to keep learning even when they couldn't always work at the same pace or show up in the same synchronous or face-to-face -face meetings. So my epiphany was extended as my students demonstrated that they were able to learn often more deeply and more thoughtfully when they were accorded flexibility as they met their life challenges. As students confronted illnesses, we started figuring out how they needed to be accommodated and I think here's the key, we extended those accommodations into the structures of the program. We changed our grading and our deadline practices to allow for more fluid and flex flexible schedules. Since we realized that our students with serious cancers were actually teaching us how to make the institution work better for all of our students who were facing a range of crossroads and detours on a weekly basis. We changed the ethos of our program. Instead of thinking of barriers as failures and pivots as bailing, we began to ask how students could flourish or sail if they let their lives interact with their course of study with no fear that this would have to, have to stop their learning. And I love this slide of a parachuter because you can't tell if he's bailing out in an emergency from the cockpit or if he's enjoying a happy skydive, right? And that's sort of the point here is that um, sometimes 
the bailing out, the rescuing of yourself in an emergency becomes the takeoff point for your next adventure, right? For the next thing that you're gonna do, and these are our strengths. This isn't just a, a story about students with illnesses, though. Um, take Casey, for example. Casey is a current student in our program. I asked him to send me a picture. That's him in an icy, icy lake. Um, he's creating a major in film with a focus in environmental and adventure-related film production. Casey wants to approach his studies with an eye towards building a global perspective, which he recognizes as, as important to the environmental issues that he's most passionate about. So he proposed a major that is fully iterative. Every semester, now that he's a sophomore, and every semester he enrolls in a different study abroad program. He surveys the course offerings and adds them to his major through a co collaborative curation process with me and his other advisors. His major is likely going to morph as his travel impacts his course selection and vice versa. Another example of this sort of innovative way of building programs uh, comes from an incredible nonprofit college in Rhode Island called College Unbound, which is a college completion program for adult learners, most of whom are Pell eligible people of color, many of whom are working full time and raising kids. The first course that these returning learners undertake is a portfolio building class where they curate their work, life, and prior learning experiences in order to apply for equivalent college credit. They hone an individual project that they pursue through the curriculum, shaping standard syllabi to their own research interests. One current student, for example, is examining how communities of color respond to diabetes education and how healthcare as a category is complicated by sociological issues and material conditions. Every, every evening seminar at College Unbound begins with a hot community meal to assure that hunger doesn't inhibit the night's learning and to acknowledge the logistical challenges of getting off work at 5 p.m. and starting class at 5.30. Students can bring their kids to class and they often do. And all of the groups are cohorted to allow for cooperative peer-to-peer -peer solutions. They deliver each other hot meals when their classmates are sick. They share childcare. They share ce celebrations. They do peer tutoring and collaborative projects. What's unique about College Unbound is twofold. First, instead of a competency or mastery-based model that simply awards credits for the reaching of certain benchmarks, the prior learning portfolio at College Unbound is a gateway to the building of a path forward. The student's previous failed academic record, it's miscoded as such by a culture that sees failure to complete in these terms, right, as a failure. Um, those failures combined with a student's life experiences, these are often the challenges that cause them to quote unquote fail in the first place. That could be having to drop out and go to work or care for an ill family member, deal with a substance abuse problem, a million other realities. These experiences combine together and they become the key to the student's resilience, strength, and most importantly, perspective. It's not a charitable action to value the resilience of vulnerable and marginalized learners because the, the academy currently underproduces research from the margins because our institutions so often don't make space for learners or emerging scholars, right, which is what learners are, from the margins. When we do make that space, it's not just the student who benefits, but the quality and shape of academic knowledge. The case in point, work on diabetes health education in communities of color. If we want that research, we have to get these scholars, right, into our, into our programs. So instead of looking at that sort of benchmark credit and competency thing as a, a kind of stopped stage where you get your credit and then you move on, I want to think instead about a sort of healthier cycle for learning. Now we can curate content from anywhere, from your life experiences, from your work experiences, from your failures and your academic successes. And we can position these into interoperable coherent configurations. So when labor markets change and your interests change, you can reconfigure all of that history that you have to do new and flexible things. We, we can critically evaluate all of these different narratives that we have um, and convert them into next steps for learners. And then that brings us new content into the machine, right? So we're constantly taking all of the pieces that we bring to the table, 
our learners are invited to bring all of the pieces that they have to the table. I go back and forth about whether what I'm talking about here is accommodations. Accommodate comes from the Latin accommodatus, to furnish with suitable room and comfort. And I really like that idea, a suitable room and comfort. Creating comfort is a double-edged sword because discomfort is an important part of learning. But there's a difference when we describe a classroom or an online learning space as safe for LGBTQ people or people of color that's categorically different from making the space safe for homophobia or racism. Comfort works the same way. In fact, we can't elicit or benefit from the productive discomfort of a challenge or of confusion unless we first assure a suitable and equitable level of comfort for all of our learners. The problem is many of us who are faculty or instructional designers, we start at the point when the students walk into our classrooms or online spaces. We set a place at the table and we work hard to make these places comfortable. But many of the conditions that make learning uncomfortable, deeply uncomfortable, are larger than course contained pedagogy. So for example, if I made the most comfortable learning environment for you that you could possibly imagine, everything you needed to learn, and then I said, I want you to meet me there tomorrow, and that place was in Perth, Australia, which I Googled and is, I think, geographically the farthest place from Toronto that I could find. Um, it wouldn't matter how comfortable that learning environment was, you could not get there, right? You couldn't be there in the room. So we can't just set the table and cook up a comf some comfort food. How do we assure that everyone can get to the table? I spend a lot of time working with institutions to examine the things that prevent our students from coming to the table to learn. And I'm not gonna go through them all here, but suffice it to say, if you start thinking about one of the things on this list, you can't figure out any reason why you wouldn't care about all of them, right? Because they're all things that keep our learners from coming into our rooms. The reason I got invited here today, besides the fact that I routinely harass the eCampus Ont e Ontario leadership about the cheesecake, um, <laughs> is that I'm an advocate for open educational resources. But people uh, misunderstand my commitment to lowering textbook costs because I really don't care passionately or even dispassionately about textbooks. I care about which students I fail to see at my table because they couldn't get to Perth. So here's the story of my first foray into OER. Um, this is where I might walk around, but you know, now I'm on a box, it's, it's scary. Um, so uh, lots of you have heard this before, so I'll go quickly, but it's the origin story, right? It's, it's an important story. This is the Heath Anthology of American Literature, and it uh, covers literature from about 1400 to 1800. So of course, the librarians in the room are all well aware that literature from 1400 to 1800 is all what? Public domain literature. So um, when I realized that my students were paying about 90 bucks for a copy of public domain literature uh, of their own American heritage, right? It seemed like the most American thing possible. Um, <laughs> and I was horrified. So I got some uh, students together. You can't really see it in that tiny slide, but um, that's just a, a really low-tech Google spreadsheet that I built. I asked some students if they wanted to participate with me in building a free replacement text for the Heath Anthology. So about 10 students showed up. Um, about five of them were actually coming into the class that fall, and they were like, you know, hell yeah, I'll save $90, right? Um, so we spent a summer um, building a replacement textbook. We called it the Open Anthology of Early American Literature. And on the first day of class that fall, I unveiled the free textbook and I was heralded a hero. Um, and it was fabulous until we started using the textbook and the students despised it. Um, and the main reason was that it didn't have all the stuff that the students really needed. So early American literature, for example, early on in the, uh, in the semester we read Cabeza de Vaca, who's a Spaniard who's exploring down in, in southeastern Florida. And of course my students are like, he's Spanish? He's in Florida? Like, what about the pilgrims? And it's just like, oh my God, it's horrifying. Um, 
But they didn't have any of the stuff that they needed, right? They didn't have the introductions, they didn't have maps, they didn't have glossaries, they didn't have footnotes. So we had a momentary panic, and then we, of course, figured out that it was really easy and exciting to solve this problem. And we had our students start doing the work of building those parts of the anthology. And they would do it like a week before we would get there. So Hannah, um, it's so great to see Hannah because um, she works for me now. So she graduated and I hired her and it's a great story. Um, but Hannah wrote a little introduction to Columbus. So by the time we got to reading Christopher Columbus, that was in the book and the students were able to read Hannah's introduction, which she was gonna write anyway. We were just gonna stick it in the LMS and it was gonna die there, right? But instead, it went into the textbook and the students used it. Hannah was excited because now she's an author. Um, students were excited because Hannah wrote exactly what they needed, right? They, Hannah did a better job with the introductions than the Heath Anthology had because she was speaking to her peers and understood what would be confusing to her peers. Um, and that's when we kind of realized like, this is gonna be a really good project. And I started getting excited, and I think this is where truly my life changed. Um, this is a guy named Jonathan, um, and Jonathan was in the class, and you know, he was fine, he wrote an introduction, it was all good, but then he was like, you know what, DeRosa, I make videos. I could make a video about the Haitian Revolution, and he made this like two minute, hyper edited kind of Jay Smoothie video that we stuck in there, and it was like gold. It was, it was funny, it was political, it was interesting, and in two minutes, they got what they needed for background to understand Toussaint Louverture. And that's when we were like, this is amazing pedagogically, right? What we had discovered there. And we started going nuts. I layered in an app called Hypothesis into the sidebar. So the students started having conversations in the side of the textbook. And the textbook became a whole community for our course, right? Far better than anything. People at the end of the semester in the evals, they were like, the best part of this class was the textbook, <laughs> which <laughs> they had never said about the Heath Anthology of American Literature. Um, and then the, the sort of mini tragedy struck, which is that I, I switched departments and I would never teach this class again with this you know, half grown amazing project. But of course it was openly licensed and it was on the web. So my colleague who replaced me forked that anthology and built a far better version with her students using what my students had done. Um, and then I thought that was kind of like the pinnacle of my life until another guy had forked it, um, a guy named Timothy Robbins at uh, Graceland University, totally you know, other place, I didn't know him, which I was like, I don't even know this person. Um, but he started ultimately working with Rebus Community, which is a nonprofit um, community that is building some great OER. They had a lot of money from like Hewlett and people. So Tim uh, became the managing editor of this Hewlett funded project to build out the anthology. When this is released later this year, it's gonna replace the Heath Anthology, the Norton Anthology of American Literature and the Bedford St. Martin. No one will use those books anymore, I guarantee it, because this is such an exhaustive uh, project. And it includes the work that my undergraduates did originally when we first built sort of a mediocre start. What a mediocre start and an incredible finish due to the collaboration in open. So that just kind of blew my mind. I had such good luck addressing the textbook cost issues in ways that also contributed to learning that I decided to listen to students and make lists of all the reasons that they were dropping out. I read research by scholars like Sarah Goldrick Rabb and I committed to not just accommodating individual students which is sort of the equivalent of America's feel-good tendency to use GoFundMe to cover healthcare costs for people. Um, so instead, what I really wanted to do was I wanted to leverage students' challenges as a catalyst for integrating more flexible delivery into our programs themselves and switch from solving problems to building accessible ecosystems. And these accessible ecosystems would give access to, you know, to knowledge that's coming to the table, getting to Perth, but also access to knowledge creation, right? Participating in the commons like my students were doing there. Solutions start with problems, and problems are not always tied to learners. For example, if we curtail the library's hours, we might increase our revenue streams, but this does not increase access or help learning or our missions. 
So if our libraries are not sustainable, we may have to make hard choices or make cuts, but we need to start by assuring access, not by focusing on revenues. Other solutions are to problems that are generated by the people selling the solutions. When the textbook company Cengage sells us OER, they are creating a doubly ironic market. They're selling a wrapping around free materials in order to combat the high cost of textbooks, a problem they are responsible for causing. <laughs> Do you know, well, I know I'm being recorded, but I will just tell you. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. Um, that Pearson did invite me to be a keynote speaker at one of their events, and I was like, do you know who I am? <laughs> and I said, why don't you go research that and then call me next week, and they, did, they didn't call me. <laughs> Actually, this is a slide from Pearson um, explaining why faculty should choose their inclusive access products. And what gets me about this slide is when I first saw it, I was like, I think I made that slide. I, I mean, I didn't, but this is a slide I use all the time um, with this Florida textbook study data um, about student success, and it's being used by Pearson to sell us, right, the idea that textbook prices are too high and we should pay Pearson. Um, this is a word cloud on the right there. This is based on words in the titles of the leadership team at Watermark, which is a company that sells TaskStream, a product that institutions use to collect data for accreditation. It also includes e-portfolio components. So uh, there's words. So these are the words. These are all the words from the titles of their leadership team, right? I didn't take any main words out. These are all the words. Words like client, sales, corporate, product, strategy, marketing. I know well the problems that these products purport to solve, but I don't like how our educational ecosystems have been boiled down to such market and tool-centered solutions. Do the experience and background of the task stream leadership team in that word cloud there match the vision that they lay out in their sales pitch? Our approach isn't full of jargon or just about the numbers. People are at the center of our I don't see any people at the center of that word cloud, right? That's the job descriptions of what their people do. And their people don't focus on people. Their people focus on products. We need a broader framework than problem solving for choosing our tools and paths, since problem solving tends to be a way of isolating issues from their contexts in order to make the solutions easier to buy. If we hope to move away from a blind faith investment in solutionism, we need to forgo the dic diction of disruption and instead steward an iterative approach grounded in praxis or the yoking of our practice and our research. Praxis is not a thing that you do once. It's a thing you develop out of repetition and critical revision, which means that all practice informed by praxis has history. And let's take a look at why that matters. So here's Anthony Lewandowski, actually that's not Anthony Lewandowski, that's just a robot of some sort. Um, but this is a quote by Anthony Lewandowski, who is uh, formerly of both Google and Uber, um, and he's one of the pioneers be behind the one technical innovation they haven't yet tried to foist on education, which is the self-driving car. Um, so this is Lewandowski. I don't, I, I, I don't know what kind of accent's about to come out of my mouth, but I apologize. I don't even know why we study history. It's entertaining, I guess, but what already happened doesn't really matter. You don't need to know that history, uh, you don't need to know that, hi that history to build on what they've made. In technology, all that matters is tomorrow. This may sound all well and good, which it doesn't, um, <laughs> until we look at the effects of techno-algorithmic designs that reject the lessons of history. For example, North Point is a for-profit company that developed the Compass Recidivism Algorithm in use all across the United States to predict which alleged criminal offenders are most at risk to re-offend. This algorithm is used in setting bond account, uh, amounts and even in sentencing. The problem is that when ProPublica did a comprehensive study of Compass, they found that the tool proved remarkably unreliable in forecasting violent crime. Only 20% of the people predicted to commit violent crimes actually went on to do so. And more disturbingly and totally unsurprisingly, 
They found that the formula was particularly likely to falsely flag black defendants as future criminals, wrongly labeling them this way at almost twice the rate of white defendants. Why is this? Because this algorithm has grown within the context of a racist criminal justice system. The technology solution, which appears to be neutral and simple, is complicated by the ideologies that produce it. We can sometimes see this effect when we look at other things outside of education, and it's clear to us. But this is inside of our world as well. So here's a slide. I, it'll be hard to see. But it's, uh, it's something similar from EAB, which is a for-profit company that, quote, harnesses the collective power of 1,400 schools, colleges, and universities to uncover proven solutions and transformative insights. Essentially, it's a data collection and analysis company, and EAB sells, quote, the Student Success Collaborative, a product in use at more than 500 different colleges and universities, which focuses on predictive analytics. My university uses SSC, and this is an image from the opening screen that popped up when I typed in my advisee's name. And what you'll see there is my student is rated a 29 out of 100 for problem solving, a 22 out of 100 for scientific reasoning skills, and look at that, a 12 out of 100 for interpersonal skills. This is also weirdly based on how they've done in certain classes, right? So if you didn't do so well in English, you have terrible interpersonal skills. It's ridiculous, right? And this is, this is the thing that pops up when your advisee walks into your office, right? This is the first screen. Not anymore because I was a little bit cranky about it, but this was the first screen that popped up. So predictive analytics in education are obviously cut from the same cloth as Compass, and we can expect both that the predictions are inaccurate in similar ways and that they're biased in similar ways. Why? Because solutions purport to solve problems by isolating data points, not by contextualizing them. And humans, out of context, become data points. And treating humans like data points is at best ineffective and at worst violent, oppressive, and obviously dehumanizing. The first question that you'll likely be asked when you do something that seems to help your students is, does it scale? But scale is about the initiative or the deliverable. Learning is about the community and the people. It happens in people rather than in external artifacts or objects, and that does make it hard to measure. Okay, this is gonna seem annoying just for a second, but we're gonna get through it, because it's a long quote. Um, but it's a great quote, and you can use this, right? And, and all these slides are tweeted out. Um, you'll see on the hashtag, you can, you can follow all of this um, and, and get the transcript of the talk. But let's look at this quote uh, from David Cohen and Deborah uh, Lowenberg-Ball from their article, Education, Innovation, and the Problem of Scale. Scale is as much, a, okay, it's too long. Okay, so let, let me just say this. It's like you're in a factory and you're making widgets and people love your widgets and so your boss says, I need like 20 million more widgets. And you go back and you have a big party with your seven person staff and you're like, we did it, we're famous, we're making widgets, we need to make 20 billion by tomorrow. And your staff's like, screw you, right? Um, that's the problem because you scale up but you haven't scaled in, right? Because your community is where innovation practice happens. So if you scale with products and not with people, your scaling fails. And that's what we see over and over again. The failure to scale is not because the idea was bad, but because you don't have the infrastructure. That's that quote, okay? It doesn't have widgets in it, but it's good. Um, when we scale a thing, we scale inside of ecosystems. Um, I just said all that, so I'm going to go on. The interaction between the initiative or innovation and the communities inside which it's embedded is the site of learning, where human communities absorb and transform new knowledge. Okay, this is a little embarrassing, but it works. What would it look like if we moved away from solutions and towards access, from disruption towards praxis, and away from scale and towards learning. Let's all agree that we will never publicly use the word human innovation. <laughs> it's just a shorthand for this room to understand this thing that we're talking about, right? Which is this human-centered framework for thinking about what's innovative. 
So I already told you that I don't really care about textbooks, and here's the other dirty little secret that will surprise absolutely no one. I also don't really care about technology. And by that, I really mean I don't care. I care about students, about learning, about education, about where we do it and how we do it, and mostly why we do it. Caring is a human quality, and I don't know any AI that replicates it. And please don't send me your examples. I don't care. Um, <laughs> what I really hope you take away from this talk today is that students are human, just like you and I are. Their educational paths are deeply intertwined with the realities of their lives. Perhaps you feel condescended to when I remind you of the humanity of learners, but the truth is our institutions are rigid and inflexible, designed for the ideal learner, unscathed by the challenges and passions of a human life. We can design learning environments that not only acknowledge and accommodate the challenges and passions of learners, but leverage it as fuel for reflection and reconfiguration. We can do this by thinking of our work as ecosystem driven, with an emphasis on access, praxis, and learning, as opposed to solutions, disruptions, and scaling. We can generate our innovation through our community interactions and iterations, and skeptically challenge product-based uh, sales pitches. Learning happens through humans interacting with content and mostly with each other. This has been a keynote focused on some stories about students and some stuff about what I've learned by teaching and by listening. I don't know how to code. I can't sell you an answer to the challenges that you're facing in your institutions. And I worry a lot about whether we're gonna be okay. But I care and I practice and I learn. And if you ask me, it's those of us who care and practice and learn who should develop the technologies of care and practice and learning that we think can serve us. Most of the tech I use now is open source, nonprofit, homegrown, indie leaning, totally wonky. Because I am not looking for a solution, you can't sell me one. I don't have a problem, I have a community. And I have a vision for how that community could better care for itself. Let's insist on tech and on teaching that grows from what our communities need in order to expand access to knowledge and to knowledge creation. Start with who you serve and bend your tools and your policies and your institutions to fit them. Our human lives are troubled and violent and unexpected and thrilling and complicated and learning takes place anyway in spite of and because of all of this. How beautiful would it be if our humanity wasn't an impediment to learning, but its heartbeat? Thank you. Did Hattie like it? Yay. Um, I would have put Hattie's picture on there if I know. Uh, I think we have a little bit of time for, for questions. Um, and I'm happy to also answer more specific things. Like if you're interested in something about College Unbound or about how our program works, uh, nitty gritty stuff, we can do that as well. So does anybody have a question? And we are gonna use some mics because we're being recorded. I think people are pointing over here somewhere. Oh, there you go. <clears throat> Hi there. Um, I was wondering if you could go into more detail about what you mean when you say scaling in. Yeah, so the idea there is that when we talk about scale, we're often focused on the outcome or the result, which is sometimes a product-oriented result. Um, so many of you work in offices, um, I would say, maybe even less faculty than support staff. So this is something the support staff are like, why do you even ask that question? Like, we all know what that means, right? So with support staff, a lot of times you'll do something and you see results and your admin is excited because you've gotten these results. Um, where I am, this is often about like retention and completion and something. So what happens is when you see a little result happen, they want more and more and more of it. They want more and more results. 
but they don't deliver more and more infrastructure to produce that result. So what we end up with then is uh, a failure because you take on more and more, and then of course the quality of your work erodes and you're not able to reach that result. And then instead of blaming the infrastructure for not being supported, they blame the idea for not being good, right? And they say, oh. And so the idea there from those authors is that when we talk about scaling, what we're really talking about is community and how our community is working. And so we should focus instead on how our community learns and develops um, as opposed to focusing on those outcomes. And the thing that gets me about this is like, of course I'm preaching to the choir a lot, really, and you're all like, hell yeah, all right? But this is better for the other folks too, right? Because they are gonna see better results if they pay more attention to infrastructure. So most of the stuff I've been interested in lately is taking these good ideas, you know, whether they're about uh, accommodating a student or producing an outcome, and thinking about how they tie to the structures of the institutions. And I very rarely let anyone on my team or like anyone talk to me if they're not talking structurally. So like if you've got a particular student, talk to me about the issue that that student has, but now tell me what is your institution going to change? It's not about what we can do to accommodate that student where the issue lives in the student, but institutionally what's going to change? And I think in general, institutions expect their teams to change, they expect people to change, they expect students to adapt, but they don't often change the processes with which they do things. And when you do change those processes, you get way better results. Then, you know, I, my, the best example of this for me came from Tara Robertson, who's sort of a, a hero of mine. Um, and she does a lot of work on accessibility and open. And she talks about like, you know, retrofitting <laughs> all over North America. People are individually retrofitting textbooks for say, for the visually impaired, right? <laughs> They'll do it over and over again at the cost of thousands of dollars, right? We haven't changed the system well enough, um, and so we end up expending many more resources dealing with these things in, in isolation. It's all part of the same failure of institutions to change their structures to accommodate humans. Instead, we want humans to change to accommodate institutions. And not only is that dehumanizing and offensive, it's also super inefficient. It's stupid, right? So that's my idea, I think. I think I can win in this room, but I don't know. <laughs> I don't know about anywhere else. Um, other stuff? Yes. Uh, hi. Thanks for your uh, presentation, Rob. Um, you you pointed out how commercial publishers will be taking open content and then, you know, repackaging it and selling it. And I'm wondering if that doesn't mean we need a different kind of Creative Commons license for that sort of thing, or if we should be putting, uh, we often say, well, we want to make things as open as possible, so we, we allow for commercial reproduction. Should we be putting in non-commercial, um, you know, the non-commercial designation for open content? Oh, Lord. So what's funny about that is I, I was having this, that, you know, if your question were a crisis, I was having that crisis uh, a couple of weeks ago. So I posted on Twitter and I said, I think I, I, think I might switch to like an NC license, what do you guys think? And man, did I unleash the demons from open, you know? No, yes, no, SA, right? And there was just like this massive thing. So actually we're hosting an office hours um, from Rebus Community. I can't remember the date, but I'll tweet it out. And they asked me to, they asked me because I'm confused and I asked the question to be part of a panel that's gonna be an, uh, an open online conversation about that exact thing. There'll be somebody from Creative Commons, me going, I don't know. Um, uh, after hearing from lots of smart people on that thread and Twitter, I think I'm leaning towards the essay share alike license, personally. Um, up until now I've used CC BY and been a little bit aggressive about the open, the most open of open licenses is the way to go. I don't really think so anymore because I, and this is just me, and I'm not like a normal, um, but I think for me, it's not just about making an artifact open. It's about building a new ecosystem. And when I think about 
what's best for one artifact, that's one answer, but what's best for a new ecosystem looks like maybe a different answer. And that's why I'm thinking about that essay license a little bit more. Um, but probably Skyping into that Rebus thing might be, you know, there'll be smarter people than me. Because it's kind of, a, you know, the essay and NC become confusing um, the more, when you first learn about them, it seems easy. <laughs> and then the more you learn about them, it becomes a more complex question. Um, and honestly, the bigger goal, like for people who are like, I don't even know what you two are talking about. Um, the bigger goal is just to be thinking about what's your long game vision for the sharing of knowledge. And once you put that question in the front of your practice, you will win the, the, the long game, I think. Um, so that, I try to kind of always lead with, with that question. As a result, my licenses do change a little bit as I, as I learn, but 